Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. So we are live, my friend. I am, Thank you for having me. Oh, man, I am, the pleasure is all mine. I've been, I've been dreaming of this interview for, for many years, ever since I first watched you uh, at Power Monkey, and I was like, this man is very smart. <laughs> I need to pick his brain as much as I can. So for everybody that's joining us, this is kind of our, we call it, I guess, our expert of the month uh, series. So every month mm -hmm. I try to bring on one person who has significantly influenced the way that I think or has changed the way that I think about gymnastics and medical treatment. And we have, we have Jay Lydon on here once, and then we had uh, Jamie, nutritionist. She's coming on as well. So we have a really cool lineup, but I think the best thing is that I can just pull from everybody else's experience and their uh, life and kind of build it into how do we help gymnastics uh, be safer, have longer careers, be healthier, and especially in a time when gymnastics is changing very fast, uh, energy systems and the cardio aspect of training is, is huge right now. So I thought of nobody else than yourself to ask to come on. Well, thank you. I really, I, I've always enjoyed our conversations and I admire um, your thirst for knowledge and, and just trying to find a better way. I, I, I always tell people, you know, especially in the sport of CrossFit, that no coach has it figured out. And, and I don't think that any coach truly has a model, even on, on uh, sports that have been around for, you know, hundreds of years. So I love your thirst for knowledge. I think that um, it's very appealing. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. I always, I tell people that, I always think that I have something figured out and I don't get an answer. I get six more questions. <laughs> so, no, I, uh, I, love when, I love when we interact on certain athletes and certain things that we see. And, and um, I find it interesting what you're immediately able to understand in terms of the context that I put things. And that's always nice. It's, it's hard when you communicate with somebody um, for the first time because you don't know what their foundation of knowledge is and and you don't know where to settle uh, that level of information meaning how simplistic or how advanced that you can go and it's cool that I could show you a photograph and you immediately can see what I see and that's awesome yeah man we've gone down the rabbit hole a couple times into some stuff and I love it yeah so, no that's the best place to start is, I mean, I have a lot of people who follow in CrossFit. They know you very well. They're, you know, through Power Monkey and stuff. But I also have a really large uh, follower base who probably is unfamiliar with your work. They're probably familiar with your work through me because everyone always thinks like, wow, you know so much about energy system training. I'm like, well, I just listen to Chris and Jay and I read a lot of books. So can you give people a very short background to kind of your athletic background, but also your coaching status right now, and just to kind of frame the conversation we're going to have? So my athletic background, I'm without a doubt, I, I come from an endurance background, uh, primarily in the sport of triathlon, uh, swimming, biking, and running. The Ironman in Hawaii, I've done um, uh, at least 10 Ironmans. Um, most I of those in my were car once. That was a pretty long run. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I look back on those days, and boy, what a monumental... Yeah, it's interesting, the brainwashing in time that you become accustomed to what you're doing and you don't think it's very significant and and in hindsight I look back on those years and it was it was more than significant um yeah I would never go back and repeat those days <laughs> really, really tough. but I uh, had a lot of success just because of genetics um and hard work mm -hmm. um but uh the sport it kind of took its toll on me in terms of the volume that I did um but I had a lot of advantages back then um, because of just the skill set. It gave me a lot of um, um, access to unique testing protocols, coaching, um, boy, even um, shoe companies and the things that they were doing. And a lot of that I've carried into today. Um, I found the sport of CrossFit uh, in my mid 40s, so actually a little over 10 years ago as a way of kind of restoring my health. And uh, I got back into coaching during CrossFit because I was given a chance to coach uh, an elite level CrossFitter that went on to the CrossFit Games, which is the premier event in CrossFit and placed second overall that year. Um, and arguably before that, he was the worst endurance athlete of the sport. And, and he went on out of the four endurance events at the CrossFit Games, he won three of them and got third in the, uh, the fourth event. Mm. And so that kind of gave me a, that gave me an opportunity to, to kind of 
follow my passion, which is coaching and, and um, finding a better way for the person who was looking at improved fitness. Um, and that's really how I, I classify that, that CrossFit market. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that something is, is incredible as CrossFit is there's so many different subsets of training energy domains and you have to be really good at a couple different areas. Whereas maybe in your experiences as an elite level, you know, runner, you were really good in that long aerobic capacity and versus someone who's an Olympic sprinter just has to focus on the short burst and stuff, but you've kind of lived in all domains. You got to constantly tweak and figure out how do I help the athlete become good at this and good at this system and kind of manage these two together. And I think that's why you have such an incredible vast you know, knowledge base, but perspective is because you see both angles, whereas some sport coaches just live in one energy system and it's kind of all they understand. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's exactly right. I, for me, you have to respect anybody's time, um, whether it's a recreational athlete or if it's someone who's trying to win the CrossFit Games. You know, I've been very lucky to be involved in coaching athletes that went on to win the CrossFit Games, uh, many, many of those. And, and, from my side of it, what I have to do is, is, is keep them interested, keep their um, performances constantly improving. And if I don't recognize their individual strengths and weaknesses um, and through assessments um, and also workout reviews, then what's going to happen is, is I may push them in the wrong direction that leads to zero adaptation. And so understanding whether or not they are a speed strength power athlete, you know, a, a fast twitch anaerobic athlete, or whether or not they're more of a slow twitch endurance athlete and looking at just their, their, their physical makeup and whether or not there are certain protocols that will drive faster adaptation. But that assessment of those athletes, no matter what level is critical, we never want to waste their time, right? especially in the sport of CrossFit where they have a thousand things that they can do. Mm. Yeah, and that's kind of something that a lot of coaches struggle with is, is trying to optimize the time they have and making sure it's efficient. And that's one of the main reasons why I really grabbed on to a lot of what you were saying is I felt as a younger coach, because I had no education in gymnastics or my own training, that I felt like I was literally just throwing stuff against the wall and hope it stick. You know, and this will kind of lead into the first question is the first, I remember the first lecture I ever sat in of yours at Power Monkey, you were talking about one of the athletes you first work with is that, and correct me if the story is wrong, but the way he tried to train his 400 meter time was just doing the fastest 400 that he could. And then he would recover until he fe felt kind of okay. And he would try to do it again. And from his point of view, that was like a golden program. And from your point of view, you're like, that is ridiculous. Like that's never going to work. You know what I mean? And I see this in gymnastics is especially in the events, the apparatuses is that people are just doing routines or exercises that look like competition, doing that training sports specific wise as much as they can. And they don't maybe understand that there's a way over multiple months to prepare those energy systems for the demand that's going to come in a much lower risk situation where in gymnastics, you're not going to do a floor routine and blow your ACL out on the last tumbling pass because you're not cardio wise, even prepared. You know what I mean? So what are your thoughts on that? So, Wow. So I, I, I love that, that first of all, that first talk that I gave made an impact. Oh, <laughs> and I, I, I went back and read many, many books after you said that kind of stuff. I was like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> but for 20 well, years, so I, I never thought that. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that if you put a stimulus on the body, um, you give it good nutrition, good recovery, it will lead to an adaptation. And the logic of the human body it doesn't need a lot of science to, to explain huge amounts of it. If I, if I give you the stimulus of running and I make you run fast all the time, then your body's going to develop an ability to perform the movement of running, but also to do it very fast. And a lot of people are confusing endurance with speed and they're on mutual ends of the spectrum. It's the same thing with fast twitch muscle fiber athletes and slow twitch athletes. But if we're trying to create a, a, a more well-rounded athlete, then we have to look at how they were training. And that's the very first thing that I do is, is in assessments of athletes is, you know, how are you currently training and what is the scope of the event that you're actually training for? And are we leaving certain energy systems, metabolic pathways behind, meaning they're underdeveloped, or certain muscle fiber groups within the body 
behind. Because one of the mistakes that I made in the sport of triathlons is that I never had a finishing kick, for example. I never had that closing speed, that speed reserve. I, I mean, I had to make my move 10K out. Yeah. That was a mistake. And, and not intentionally. It's just that the people that I had were, were, were focused on nine hour long events and not my finishing sprint. And I, I never understood why I didn't have that. I mean, I never went into the weight room when I was doing the sport of triathlons. I never picked up a barbell. Um, and in hindsight, it's obvious why I had no explosive power. And so part is, is that I want athletes to look at themselves and are they leaving muscle groups behind, motor units behind that can contribute to their overall fitness? Um, I mean, I think that you're on the gymnastic side. The question would be is that, are there certain motor units within the movements, the routines that they're doing, being ignored by mm -hmm. the way in which they're training? And what we want to do is develop that entire spectrum of muscle fibers. Right. Yeah. And that's, again, you're going to hear a certain pattern. There's moments when I listen to you and I thought, wow, I never thought about it that way. And something that I always embraced and never really did, again, mistakes as a younger coach is I would only train bursted 30 to 60 second efforts thinking that that's all gymnastics needed that's how we compete from seven seconds to 90 seconds i was like there's no value in long aerobic training there's no value in doing longer circuits because i just thought that if you train the sport you'd be okay and what i came to realize from reading more about the information you said is that you know the aerobic capacity of a bursted athlete is very valuable because in those three systems you have your you know your very short bursted seven second pcr and then your middle phase glycolytic and then your longer plus two minutes is that between repeat bursted sprints between doing a turn or doing a 60 second effort you have to recover through your aerobic system and i was like oh my god that makes so much sense i see it all the time i watch olympic level athletes do a floor routine and they are like blacking out after they do a floor routine because they can't recover fast enough and they get rushed to the next event and then they perform very poorly on the next event because they haven't recovered. That is your aerobic system, right? And I think that I've tried to change my thought process about that. Maybe there's value in training, again, that entire spectrum of fibers for the actual performance, but to recover between bouts. Yeah, I mean, I find that the sport of gymnastics is, is very interesting in the sense that you know, you have these multiple routines and, and in large part, they're, they're shorter duration. Um, I also like the fact that when they rotate, th that you have a, a set amount of rest um, in between your routines. And, and I would think that to optimize performances, you would need to be taking into consideration the time domains for all of those routines, as well as the recovery between those routines right. in order to maximize performance. And, one of the things, and, and, and forgive me for, for not knowing a, a lot about gymnastics, I mean, I know the sport, but not in depth, that space in between, like you were mentioning, that 10 minutes between routines, I, I see athletes sitting. Yeah. Um, and when you, let's face it, just like I said, if you practice sitting, meaning a passive recovery, then your body only becomes good at yeah. passive recovery. And my question would be is, is it known, is it proven that I can do a active recovery within that 10 minute time period? And would I clear more lactate that just accrued in that previous routine by, by actually performing the movement? And would that put me in a better position for the next routine? Right. Yeah, that's very and, interesting. And that is true though. I mean, an active recovery, if you, practice it. I mean, one of the things that I tell CrossFitters all the time is I love the assault bike after you do a workout. I like it. Mm. Um, if that workout is really long and you are, are creating blood lactate, then I like the fact that, that there are so many muscles being used that could potentially pull that lactate out of the bloodstream and consume it as a fuel in my slow twitch aerobic fibers. But the thing is, is that if they never practice that movement, they have never done an assault bike after uh, training to mm. clear blood, lactate, then the body's not efficient at it. You have to practice it. Mm. So if a gymnast is sitting in a chair during their 10 minutes, that's all they become good at. Mm. This is something that 
needs to be added to their training protocol to develop or accelerate the rate in which their muscles that have just worked so explosively, right, and developed not only blood lactate, but imagine the tremendous localized lactate that's developed in the muscles moving and the neighboring muscle groups um, is massive. Yeah. And if they, they focused on that in their training um, and included protocols of that, the recovery period, um, that 10 minutes, their body would be more prepared for the next routine, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's really intriguing. And that's something that I had thought about, but never really connected the dots on is like, you're using, like you said, it's a massive dosage of local muscular fatigue. You build up all this lactate, the neighboring muscles, and then your blood lactate, you know, you're carrying you, you're carrying that with you to the next event that requires the exact same muscle group. Can you imagine somebody doing a max effort, two minute thruster, and then the next event, 10 minutes later is a one rep max thruster. You know what I mean? It's the yeah. same thing. It's like, you're starting off at a, at a baseline below and you have to train for that. Well, and imagine, I mean, that's where I would assume injuries occur, is that, oh. that there is so much precision in your sport and the, the amount of speed, strength, and power and, and, and the, the, from a technical side, and you throw in muscular fatigue, the fact is, is that coordination is going to fall. And I would think that we would want to put those athletes in the best possible position, meaning the most recovered mm. going into the next routine. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would I would feel bad for athletes that if they had to do floor first and they're not aerobically fit, um, that it would probably compromise their their upcoming performances. Yeah, you got a long couple of events coming if you if you get the unfortunate random order of floor first. And that's been shown in some studies we talked about is that people's performance was definitely uh, correlated worse with people who started on the harder taxing events because now they're carrying that fatigue through the event, you know, and I think that's important to think about on a competition thing, but it's also a gymnast practice for four hours sometimes, you know, a four hour repeated BERT practice and so many injuries happen in practice because I, I see the error being made that most coaches are just like, well, you're not mentally tough enough. You're not focused enough and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but physiologically they may be in the tank and you're asking them to do very high skilled movements at the end of a practice, at the end of a competition. And like you said, fatigue induces proprioceptive issues. And then you, you fall or you, you blow your leg out because you're, you're let, you're completely gassed. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm curious. So that the length of time for a, a floor routine, how long is that? Uh, about 90 seconds, 70 to 90 seconds for, it depends on the setting, but some of the higher end routines are up to about 90 seconds. And it is, it is essentially a, a four second maximal, like doing a one RM pot, like clean and jerk for four or five seconds. And then you have a little bit of recovery, four or five second pass recovery dance four like it's just a six to seven passes within a 90 second routine. Right. But you have these, let's call them surges in the middle of that routine. Right. 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 So it, it basically goes from something that is super explosive uh, to almost a, a active recovery. Yeah. And I bet that if you, if you correlate it to running, it'd be like running a, a 200, 300 meter and doing, you know, 20, 20 meter sprint, recover, 20 meter sprint, recover, 20 meter sprint, recover until you get to about 200 to 300 meters. That's, a, that's about the same time domain. Right. So that to me is interesting. So if it's a 90 second routine, I mean, that, a 90 second routine, if we just look at where the energy is coming from to make the muscles contract, more than 50% of the energy is coming aerobically. Right. And so if their training is only consisting of shorter time domains, just like a lot of CrossFitters back when I, you know, in 2013, where they just worked on speed, strength, and power, mm. that's all they became good at. But if you know that an event, is the majority of that one event is aerobic and you are not training your aerobic slow twitch fibers, then there's a significant hole in your, your arsenal of fitness. Yeah. And, and so, I, 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 so part of the, the, the great thing about CrossFit is that we do all sorts of movements. I mean, we do gymnastic movements and weightlifting movements. Um, and I look at those movements and how can we put an athlete in a position to become better at those particular movements. Mm. And you must include the aerobic system, especially in the sport of CrossFit, because we're doing time domains in gymnastic movements and weightlifting movements longer than 90 seconds. Right. 
right? Yeah, and this is, again, next to the, the next point that you and I had a pretty aha moment on is in gymnastics, it's so bizarre because the, like in, in male gymnastics, the upper body is moving fast and producing lactate, but the entire lower body and core is in a maximal isometric contraction, right? Like you're squeezing your legs and your, and your core as hard as you can to try to get the best power production and stiffness to kind of bounce and do things. That's how you're efficient through the air. And the women are the other side, whereas they use their legs a lot and their upper body is often very much isometric and holding aside from a few events. And so you and I were talking about how like, that's a pretty rare situation in a sport where one half of your body is working in a fast glycolytic output and the bottom is working in an isometric, like very slow twitch fiber. Like training for that is challenging. Yeah, but I think that just coming up with different protocols and trying things with athletes. I mean, right. some things will work on certain athletes. I mean, that's the thing that that's, I've learned in CrossFit is that there's a broad range of, of, of um, population in terms of, of sure. ability and, and genetics. And not everything works for everybody. And, yeah. and I love the idea of, of trying certain things and establishing protocols during training. Um, one of the things that, that is interesting is that, you know, in gymnastics, the, the, the time domains and the recovery periods are known. The muscle fiber groups um, are, uh, and during those routines are also known mm -hmm. um, in, can, in creating uh, workouts that, that can help those adaptations would be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, I mean, as far because we would know the muscle groups, and and I love the idea in gymnastics of doing things not just specific towards the movement, like take the girls in the vault. That to me seems like a very you know five, six, seven seconds short time domain, very explosive. But maybe, maybe practicing um, working on that pure sprint um, and being explosive, meaning pushing a sled, pulling a sled, and then going into a recovery period, simulating that walk back to the vault. Um, I would think that that second vault becomes pretty tricky for those athletes because that phosphorus system hasn't had a chance to recover. Right. Um, but if we are training very high intensity, um, like a sled into a recovery of shorter time domain, um, I think we can create a very similar stimulus, meaning something like doing a, a six second sled sprint, um, whatever the equivalent time to hit the vault is. Mm -hmm. And then what I want to do is I want to do a recovery based upon the amount of time it takes for them to get back and do the second vault. And I want to do multiple rounds. I never want to allow that athlete to fully recover. And we call this like lactate stacking type workouts or lactate tolerance workouts where each round is going to get more difficult for them to push the sled because of the accrued lactate in the localized muscle group. And then it's going to spill into the bloodstream. And the athlete's job is to keep the motor units firing. Mm. What we're looking for is a high degree of motor recruitment under high doses of lactate. And we put them in a position where that they will underperform in terms of their, their sled push total distance within that six seconds, but that's because of the accrued lactate. And that to me would be a, a workout that would help them in not only the recruitment of fast twitch explosive street, speed strength power motor units, but it would also help them with the recovery and then also performing under higher and higher doses of lactate. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just like pure gold right there. I think that that concept has probably the biggest impact for change in terms of injuries and also performance. And I honestly think that it will become gold standard in the next few years in, in gymnastics, because like you said, the time domains and the approximate efforts are known and you can train for that. I think that coaches that understand the basics of energy systems can maybe take a month in the summer before they start doing these very hard routines and train these adaptations in a very low risk environment, right? Like pushing a sled sucks, but it's not going to hurt you right? Like it's very uncomfortable, but it's not going to hurt your legs. So you can do that for a month and slowly push the fibers. And then maybe in the following month, which is what I try to do with the girls that we coach is actually do that in a tumbling. So they tumble into a foam pit where it's low risk. They're not going to get hurt. And then it slowly 
changes those global adaptations to specific adaptations. And then right before your first meet, you actually do those things in a floor team. But definitely up top in your brain is that if you have two months of training under your belt, you're not panicking when you stand in the corner and you have to do another routine or you have to do another pass. And you're like, oh my God, I hope I make it, you know? I would think that those would be competitive advantages for these athletes because totally. putting them in a position that they know no one else is, is, is doing those things. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I also like the idea of, of finding movements. I mean, if we look at like the pommel horse um, and like you said, the, the, the upper body is doing a tremendous amount of, of anaerobic work and the amount of lactate that's accruing in the localized muscles. and you know, it's spilling into the bloodstream. I mean, the fact that, that they get lactate measurable in their bloodstream after doing the pommel horse tells you the level of intensity. Right. I mean, it's really remarkable. And I would think that <clears throat> protocols that, that work the extremes of what they're about to experience, meaning we want to create an environment that is more extreme than what they're about to experience in the competition from the intensity side, but we also want to cover the other side of the spectrum and doing something that's more on the recovery side. Mm. So meaning doing a pommel horse routine and then going into an act of recovery um, and mimicking those same movement patterns right. where the legs, you know what, they're locked out. Um, I'm assuming there'd be tension in the hip flexors and maybe going into some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a movement like a, like a, a, a weighted, a, a weighted, a heavily weighted Russian twist, you know, with a 55 pound plate doing Russian twists and bouncing it off the floor and um, yeah. Yeah. movements like that were, 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 were mimicking the movement patterns that just occurred, but yeah. extending the length of time under, under control where it's safe. Yeah. And this was another, again, another big revelation that I had for you is that I remember you talking about VO2 max tests and talking about local lactate and how, it's specific to the fibers and the movement that you're training, right? And this is when I really started to change a lot of the way that I was doing energy systems is my traditional upbringing in gymnastics was either we would run sprints or we would do routines. That's how we majorly trained for our cardio, right? And not understanding that if you want to train for the movements of gymnastics routines, you have to create the adaptations in the motion or the movement of what you're training. So us just doing sprints was very localized lower body fatigue and challenging, but we were never teaching our chest and our deltoids and our triceps to create and buffer fatigue, right? And that's something that I've changed a ton is now we do a lot of specific, you know, general upper body lactate flooding or lactate stacking workouts before we ask them to do a ring routine because that's pretty much all arms for 90 seconds, right? Yeah. And that, that's super yeah. important for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think that those things are important. I like the idea of doing these lactate clearance type workouts that are focused on the clearance of localized lactate. So, I mean, we've been talking a lot about uh, blood lactate. Um, and that, that, that obviously is a, a, a valuable training protocol. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it is because it's occurring within the sport of gymnastics that, that the amount of, of speed and strength and force and power is so significant that we're generating blood lactate but you also must recognize that that localized lactate in the muscles that are creating that blood lactate are needing of recovery. And part of what we would like to do is, is to work those muscle groups on their ability to clear that lactate. And so finding protocols that mimic the movements, but then finding a similar protocol using the same movement patterns and clearing that localized fatigue. Um, so think of it as a concept of if we're, you know, doing something simple such as, um, let's say we do push-ups and we can do high intensity push-ups for a set amount of time and generate massive doses of localized fatigue mm -hmm. in those push-up muscles and then flipping over on our back and mimicking it with the floor press with no weight. Right. Just think of that as your jog recovery. Those types of things, what we're really doing is, yes, we're focused on lactate clearance, mm. but think about what we're really doing. We're getting these athletes through an active recovery performing that movement for a longer amount of time. Right. And that is giving them an aerobic level adaptation. I mean, one of the things that, that we need to recognize is that one of the major measures of aerobic fitness is 
your rate of recovery. Right. A more aerobically fit athlete is going to recover faster. And so if a gymnast is saying, I am tired going into my next routine, then they've just identified their weakness. And that's what we expect from an athlete. Tell me where your weaknesses are. And then what I do is design a stimulus to adapt that weakness. Mm -hmm. But if an athlete is not in tune with that, or if we ignore it, then they're lost. Yeah. An athlete's job is to identify where they're struggling. And as soon as they communicate that to us, our task is easy. Yeah, and I, I agree. I see a lot of people who are banging their head against the wall because they, they feel like they're at their ends of their knowledge level. And they, the athlete will say something like that, like a keyword. We are like, man, my legs feel like concrete when I try to walk to my next event. Like that's a very important keyword to listen to because the athlete is telling you what we need to work on. You know, they're, they're, they're signaling their weaknesses. It's not that well, I, I mean, can perform. Well, so let just the hypothetical. I mean, for you and people that, that mm -hmm. listen here is that mm -hmm. so I was in the North Shore of Oahu and uh, I was with a bunch of elite level surfers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that CrossFit's been really great on is that I, I'm pretty good at, at training and listening to athletes and where they identify their problems right. and finding protocols then to address that. And when these surfers were talking, they were saying that the number one injury in surfing is a blown ACL. And you could see how that happens because they're coming down the face of a wave and the water is choppy and the board and the impact, and especially, you know, the back leg and the angle that it's at, you can see it hits a, you know, chop of water and boom, there goes the ACL. Yeah. But my, my quest for what they're, they're, what they were really saying goes beyond that. Why wasn't their leg more stable? Why wasn't it, was their leg wobbly? Mm. And they said to me, they said, but our legs don't do anything. Our legs aren't tired when we're paddling out to hit the lineup. And I said, let me ask you something. How fatigued is your upper body when you hit the lineup? And they said, oh my gosh, sometimes it's just like we can't, even though the perfect wave comes, we can't take it because our upper body is so smoked. Yeah. And we know if we have to re-paddle out that it will compromise us. And so I said, so the amount of fatigue in your upper body is so great that you have to take a long amount of rest. Absolutely, they say. So the thing is, is that what they're not recognizing and they don't know is that localized fatigue in the upper body translates into the fatigue in the neighboring muscle groups. And then just like in gymnastics, it hits the bloodstream. And when it hits the bloodstream, <clears throat> It goes throughout the entire body, <clears throat> excuse me. And what it's trying to find is vacant muscle groups, slow twitch aerobic fibers to try and clear it. Yeah. And so where does it go? For a surfer, it goes to the legs. Right. But imagine, imagine a surfer doesn't realize that their legs are pre-fatigued before they go and stand on a 30-foot wave. Mm. That's what's happening to a gymnast is that it's only upper body. Yeah. But what they don't realize is, is that their lower body, because it's not aerobically fit, it is not able to clear the fatigue that just built up in an upper body routine. Yeah. That is the consequence of, 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 of what's happening. And there, the athlete is sitting going, I have no idea what's wrong. I went upper body to upper body to upper body, and my legs feel like jello. Mm. I don't get it. And that's what surfers were saying. Right. I don't understand why my legs are wobbly I they associated it with fear and what it was was it was localized fatigue and so the protocol is is that they thought that you would be have to go into a running based program and the thing is is that what we want to do is we want to simulate the movements that they're actually experiencing that fatigue and so if they're in a prone position and they're paddling out to the lineup I want them to slowly be kicking their legs while they're, while they're moving out so that that kick can help clear the fatigue. But if they never practice the movement of kicking, if they never train their aerobic slow twitch fibers in the movement of kicking, then they're not gonna be efficient at the removal of that lactate. So the protocols for them is, you know what? We need to do kicking sets in the water, no fins, short fins, long fins, and I'm gonna develop your capacity to clear fatigue in the legs while you're paddling out for the lineup. Now, you do stand, and so we have to have some running, right. but it's going to be far, far less than, than kicking protocols. It needs to match the movement that they perform. 
Yeah. And that's, I mean, just as you were talking ahead, like almost an epiphany or a fascinating insight is that's exactly what's happening in gymnastics, right? So the order of events in gymnastics, regardless of where you start, you, you go around in what's called Olympic order. So for male gymnasts, they do parallel bars and then high bar and they have to go to floor. So upper body, blow your arms out, upper body, blow your arms out. And then I feel like garbage before I start floor team. And by far the research is clear in gymnastics injury epidemiology is the number one injury is lower body impact. So whether you over time land and you get hurt or you're chronically developing it. So whether that's your, your again, with the global lactate is jelloing your legs and you you can't absorb well into a squat pattern, or you have a traumatic blowout of your meniscus because you land and you hyperextend your leg. The same thing happens for women. They do vault and they go to bars and then they have to go to balance beam and floor second. So they go upper body, upper body, lower body with high level of balance. And then they end on lower body, maximal power output. I mean, that totally connects the dots for me of why maybe we have such a staggering injury rate. It's like a 75% injury rate in gymnast, gymnastics and they're tearing their Achilles left and right. They're tearing their ACL left and right. Maybe a huge part of this is the, is the inability for us to recognize that the slow twitch fibers of the lower body should be used to recover between events to try to buffer some of that lactate that's floating around the body now. Absolutely. So I, I mean, just what you were saying there. So you have two upper body events back to back. Now imagine if your upper body that first movement generates localized lactate yep. and it's going to go into the bloodstream. So, I mean, the studies that I've seen on, on gymnastics, that, that it's enough energy output that they're going to create lactate in the blood after that movement, right. because they're not those muscle groups aerobically fit, mm -hmm. that lactate is going to stay in those muscle groups, meaning for the next event, they're going to stack and meaning the level of lactate is going to go even higher. Right. Meaning the amount that's in the bloodstream is going to be even higher, yeah. which it's going to go down in the legs. And so the problem would be is just like the surfer. They're not aware that their legs are pre-fatigued. Their assumption is it was upper body and upper body. Yeah. And my legs haven't done anything. So it will be a relief to go and do leg work. Yeah. The problem is, is that's not true. Yeah. That's not true. And, and the athlete, if they're not aware that that blood lactate is going to damage their ability in that next floor routine, that's how they could get hurt because they're not fresh. If they're comparing their performances during a workout when they are fresh and now they're fatigued, they're not able to do what they were once able to do in the gym. Mm. It's not fair for them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's pretty incredible because I think globally as a sport, everybody runs into that same problem. They get to that, they're like, man, I have no idea why you bombed your floor routine. When we were at a four-hour practice and you had 20 minutes to rest, you were fine. You know, there was no big deal. But when we went to a competition and you were last on high bar and then you got rushed to the first of the order on floor, you had a five-minute turnaround recovery and you just completely bombed. And I've had, looking back on my career, I've had plenty of times when I had to go from one event to the next and I got rushed in a rotation and I shit the bed completely. And I was like, dude, I've nailed that routine a hundred times. Like, what's wrong with me? Like, I, it's, it must be my head game. It must be the pressure. It must be the, it must be the crowd. <laughs> you know, it's like, probably not. And I must assume that, I mean, with gymnastics, the, the mental game, the emotional game is, is a massive part of it. And imagine if you're an athlete and you're like, you, you mess up in something because of leg fatigue and you're, you're just not aware of, of physiology and how lactate travels and the damage that, that those two prior routines did. Imagine what that now does to that poor athlete going into these next events. Mm. It's, uh, so part of it is, is like my feeling is, is that you know, we as coaches, our job is to create um, – it's, it's really to create performance improvements and, and fitness gains and those, those obvious um, areas. But in my opinion, the number one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to create knowledge. Mm. Um, yeah. That knowledge in that athlete is going to make them more confident. And if an athlete is aware that these things happen um, in these routines and that the legs are going to be wobbly and that is normal, mm. uh, I think that the emotional mental side won't be as great, but as coaches, I mean, one of the things that we need to recognize is that we need to, to develop them, to put them in the best possible position physically and mentally from 
routine to routine. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that, I mean, obviously education for coaches is huge, but educating the athletes about why you're doing certain workouts, what the intention is, the goals, why it's specific to what the training goals that you want. Like that's very important. And even, I mean, I work with 12 to 15 year old girls and I, I still explain to them that the, not in such complicated terms, but why we're doing it, what it's going to feel like. I usually do it with them side by side. So they see me rolling around on the ground, just like they are. But if you give that athlete empowerment of why it's happening, what we're doing it for and how it correlates to your performance, they're typically much more involved and they're understanding that. And I've seen, especially in, I mean, gymnastics is one of the most mentally high pressure sports that exists in terms of how much pressure gets put on the athletes and from studying some of like the energy system stuff and the navy seal stuff is that somebody who's freaking out about how tired they are and they're panicking because their legs feel awful and they're and they're stressed out about that that's still recruiting metabolites that's still recruiting cortisol it's yeah. still doing that so when someone stands there terrified and i've witnessed this from fortunately being at the games of some athletes is that the people who can calm themselves down and say like nope my coach taught me about this this is a normal part of how i should feel and they can damper their system down they actually have more like metabolic reserve to perform well because they're not burning through all of their energy when they're standing there in the waiting tank and they're like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god you know they're they're actually able to calm themselves down and that's a huge performance advantage that i've seen is people who understand the mental part of calming their system down and understanding that that's a way to modulate their stress response and a way to modulate their, the metabolic responses you got to be able to teach the athlete this sucks i know it's uncomfortable but you have to stay calm. You have to breathe. You have to trust your training. This is so important, you know? Yep. I see that when I, I put athletes in the pool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Almost drowning and, people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I asked them, I said, you know, I always ask them up front when we go to the pool, I said, so can you hold your breath for a minute? And these are games athletes that, you know, top 10 into CrossFit games. And I said, can you hold it for a minute? And they but it's just a joke. It's a silly question. Of course they can. And they do. And, and I have them show me. And, and then what I do is I take them to the pool and they put their, they sit at the edge of the pool deck with their feet in the water. Mm. And um, I tell them, I said, I want you to slide down the wall underneath the water. And I want you to push off and just swim the 25 yards across the pool underwater, mm. no breathing. Yeah. And if they've never done it before, they'll pop up in seven seconds. And that's what that adrenaline rush does, yeah. is that it's, it's a very real thing. And, and when you throw fear in there, you throw anxiety in there, it's going to compound the problem. Total game changer. Yeah, so I, I, that's where I, it comes back to. that the, it's, it's important that athletes are aware of what's happening to their bodies. Right. Um, but... That would then, if I was an athlete, I would say, okay, so then how do we prepare for that? Right. How do we best prepare for that so that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. And that's what should be done. I mean, if you are given 10 minutes, which isn't a lot of time, um, then you should leverage that 10 minutes because it's part of the performance. It's yeah. part of, it, it's your event. Right, right. And, and, and just because we're calling it, you know, transition time mm. uh, it, it's, it's still part of the the competition oh it's huge yeah it's, it, and i would argue it's probably equally if not more important than the actual performance itself because you've probably prepared yourself for the routine a thousand times over what you haven't right. trained for is the the transitions you haven't trained yourself for the mental pressure of having to do that but yeah that's that's huge man that's equally as important to train in the environment as much as you can as the okay. actual skills what is your routine between those two movements, yeah. that, that 10 minute time period, what is that routine? And it should be autopilot. Mm -hmm. Every single piece of that time should maximize the performance of the next routine. Yeah. And if they don't have a protocol, then I would think that that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a opportunity for, for performance improvement. There should be a protocol, no matter what you are doing afterwards, I mean, you look at Olympic level swimmers, look at Michael Phelps and how he, when he goes to the Olympic games, he is swimming back to back events. He is given a very small amount of time to recover, but his protocol, right. of what he must do between events is critical. Mm. He not sitting in a chair. What is he doing? He's actually going in and doing an active recovery in the pool yeah. between events, more swimming. But what if, what if Michael Phelps didn't have the aerobic capacity, meaning he never trained volume, mm. then that recovery would be detrimental. 
So here's part of the, 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 the paradox here is that what if you never do enough volume? And now what you're telling me is I got to do some volume during my 10 minute break. And that ultimately is going to create a muscular stamina failure because I'm not fit enough mm. to do that much exercise. Mm. That is the catch 22, but that should identify the weakness then. Yeah. If you are not able to perform an active recovery because of fitness, then it shows you how weak your active recovery is. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's, quite a paradigm shift, especially for gymnastics is, is nine times out of 10, when somebody realizes the athlete falls apart, for some reason, they don't know, they don't focus on enhancing the active recovery, they focus on we need to do more work, we need to do more in that two minute window of flooding your body with lactate, they think that that's how you get the game changer. But not really, you know, maybe we need to flip the coin and say, how can we optimize your recovery between bouts, not so much how much punishment can you take in two and a half minutes. Well, so I think it's both. I think that what you should be doing is, is both. I think that, that there is no doubt that the majority of the events within um, the routines mm -hmm. are anaerobic, speed, strength, power. And the amount of speed, the amount of force that you can generate under high doses of lactate, mm -hmm. meaning anaerobic capacity, is critical. Like that, like a sprinter, is critical. You've got to be able to perform with higher and higher doses of lactate. So we wanna develop that ability and we wanna be careful not to convert these, these athletes um, into more aerobic capacity athletes. We wanna maintain that power. But right. what we wanna do is we wanna give them the capacity to accelerate the rate of recovery. And if we are not incorporating lower intensity training and I, I'm, I'm not talking about like low intent, like 60% of, of heart rate training. What I'm talking about is 80%, 80, 85% yep. uh, yep. training. Um, if we're not incorporating that lower intensity training, then I think that they're going to have muscular stamina related failure. They're not spending enough time in that movement. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very important. I think that something that people have resonated well with when I kind of apply your principles and teach them is, is the ability to maximize your time in a workout. So say you have 25 minutes to do some sort of a workout and it's hard when you're in a group setting, but it's better probably to understand the nature of the adaptations you're chasing and maybe do three lactate flooding rounds with a longer recovery. Again, teaching the athlete why we're doing it, doing some active recovery work in between the sets and also helping them understand that, man, you're going to feel awful on that second round, but this is where you're gonna push yourself to get through it. So I say, maybe we just do a two minute bout with a six minute recovery and we focus on the energy system, not just you know, a 25 minute throw a bunch of exercises at you and it becomes just a steady state aerobic workout. Now you've taken 25 yeah. minutes into a, a moderately intense aerobic like you know, threshold workout instead of doing three two minute bouts that are specific to the muscle groups, to the energy system and to the adaptation that you're looking for. And that usually is like, Personally, what I found has been the biggest game changer for me in using some of your work is I, I can maximize 20 minutes really well with the group of athletes by designing and understanding a workout than I can of just doing, okay, everybody move for 25 minutes. And if you're hot and sweaty, maybe we got something productive. I really, really like that. I mean, that's the thing is that we have to recognize that those workouts that they're doing, the focus has been how much volume, mm -hmm. meaning how much time am I moving? Mm -hmm. And what's the level of intensity for that movement? Yep. And what you just identified is the recovery element. The three, those three main qualities are all equally valuable, meaning the intensity is, is as important as the duration as, in, as important of the recovery. Not only the type of recovery, but the amount of recovery. And we need to make, make sure that we are... are, um, are it, identifying the amount of time and recognizing the recovery time. The athlete also needs to understand that all three of those things are equally as important right. because sometimes it's the recovery that is preventing them from doing the volume or matching up of the sure. intensity. Sometimes sure. it's the recovery that's the weakness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always tell people that, you know, when I ask him, I said, how many push-ups can you do unbroken? And I mean, for a gymnast, let's just say, you know, for real push-ups, let's just say they could do 50 push-ups. Yeah. 
why can't you do one more? Yeah. Is it because you're not strong enough? Is it that you can't generate the speed, the strength, and the power? Or is it that you just get tired? Yeah. If you just identified that you get tired, then it is the recovery that is standing in your way of additional work capacity. Right. And it's a relationship. And that's what people need to understand is that it is a relationship. Work capacity is dependent on your intensity going in, but your recovery going out. You can't just keep freight training more intensity. You yeah. can't. You can't just push more in. You eventually are going to fatigue. And the athlete that can clear that fatigue at a faster rate will be able to put more intensity in. Yeah. It's a relationship. Yeah. And, that, and that's all that stuff is just so important. I think it's going to be something that changes quite a bit. And I really liked how you, again, you, you understand gymnastics, but you've never trained in it. But in the moment you were able to say, what about a six second sled push? And then we slowly recover somebody back to the vault runway. Like that's exactly what needs to happen is people need to understand the principles and like, okay, well maybe we could try this workout, right? Or, you know, a 20, 20, 20 building and slow recovery workout. Like I'm curious of your thoughts and we'll, we can wrap it up on this because I respect your time. But so say we have the biggest problem we've identified is again, two back to back upper body events and then a lower body event coming within 10 minute window. What is something that you would think would be valuable for a gymnast to train to try to build fatigue up body and then clear that with the lower body? Is there a certain like workout you would, you would value for that? Well, so I think that just looking at just the, all the entire events is yeah. it's the very first thing that I would do. I, I mean, that's the thing that makes CrossFit so challenging is that most of the time we have no idea what the workout is. We've yeah. never, yeah. And when we, we walk in, we see that workout and we look at it and it's like, wow, I've never seen that movement combination. I've never seen that load scheme. Um, and it's completely unknown. Yeah. Gymnasts have the answers to the test. <laughs> given the, you, you know exactly what the workouts are. There are zero, zero surprises. Hmm. And so <clears throat> if we refer to that as, as specific training, meaning that if you're given the test, then, then specifically train for the answers to that test and just like you know when identifying you know the the vault in that six seconds look at that and now let's train that and one of the things that we want to make sure we do is we train way beyond the time domain in the competition so that the body is prepared for something much greater sure. um, we do know that if we increase the amount of time that there's you know a greater level of overload and that's where we're going to find that adaptation. Mm. I think that <clears throat> that is the number one thing that we need to be looking at yeah. is those events and identifying what movement patterns are being done within those events, what time domains are being done. And then we can start writing workouts and protocols mm. to maximize the performance as they progress through, through the routine. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, very important is looking at the broad spectrum and then breaking those chunks down into specific workouts or specific, again, adaptations you're looking for. And then you can kind of build on that. And I think that's what I've learned the most is you just got to tinker a little bit. You got to use the principles, look at the sport, look at the movements and try some stuff. And then just kind of flow back and forth between adjusting workouts. There's no, there's no set. Nobody has an answer. <laughs> you know, nobody has the golden rule. No, and I think that just applying logic of the human body yeah. that, and, and, and understanding, I mean, that's the thing that I've realized. So I incorporate with the people that, that are at the elite level at the CrossFit Games, they run two times per week. And, mm -hmm. and when I say run, they're, they're maybe running 12,000 12, kilometers. So um, not very far, you know, very seven miles in a week. Mm -hmm. um, and what I recognize is that that is not enough volume to interfere with their performances in the weightlifting side of the equation or the gymnastic side of the equation. Mm. Um, this interference effect is something that is unknown. We don't know what is considered enough volume or enough intensity to interfere with another movement. Mm. But one of the things that's been fascinating is that, you know, I've been lucky enough to coach, you know, Two, more than two dozen champions at the CrossFit Games, and, and every single one of them by running that amount has gotten stronger. And that includes Rich Froning and Matt Frazier, who, you know, former, you know, yeah. he went to the Olympic Training Center for weightlifting, has gotten stronger. And we, we recognize that that interference effect um, 
with at least that amount of volume is a contributor to overall performance. Mm. And that's what I find exciting about gymnastics is that I truly believe that it will lead if they develop their entire spectrum of motor units, there's going to be an increase in overall performance. Mm. Um, if gymnasts are neglecting their legs and especially their aerobic capacity of their legs. And what I'm talking about is incorporating a small dose of, of volume so that it doesn't interfere with the other movements. Right. Um, just as I said about in CrossFit and running, yep. then they're going to have an overall performance improvement. I mean, imagine if they have neglected the aerobic capacity of their legs and imagine if their legs, while walking from one routine to the next, or let's just say if they are walking during that 10 minutes, instead of sitting in a chair and their legs are more aerobically fit because of incorporating a small amount of supporting your structure aerobic fitness, they're gonna be in a much better position. And that to me would be, boy, that would be Huge. really exciting yeah. because, you know, it's the same thing I tell people. It's like if a marathon runner comes into your CrossFit gym, what's your value proposition? And it's not going to be nutrition and mobility. And it's not. They just want to know, I want to be faster. That's it. That's it. And so the question is, is are they neglecting other muscle groups that are preventing them from maximizing their body's fullest potential, their body? And the thing is, is that their legs, we've got to assume they're fully optimized. Mm. What about through the protocols of CrossFit, I can improve the aerobic capacity of other muscle groups that are used in the movement of running yeah. more thoroughly, meaning the upper body. Because when their lactate develops in the localized muscle groups of the legs, it goes to, to the bloodstream and it eventually hits the upper body. Right. And what if their upper body can clear lactate at a faster rate? What does their legs, what can their legs do? Yeah. They can move faster. Yeah. Right. And that's what we're talking about here. I think it's really an exciting space for the innovative coach and athlete that has identified their weakness of being, I just get tired. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all such great stuff. And I think that's a really good place to end on before we start diving off cool. of some weirder stuff. But um, man, Chris, I can't thank you enough for all you've taught me and I can't thank you enough for your time. I think that, uh, you don't realize it, but your contribution to power monkey and to the world of gymnastics is going to help a lot of people around the world stay a lot safer and also probably perform at a degree that we've, we've never seen before because never before in 25 years of gymnastics, how have I ever thought about things like this or like you have taught me? So I thank you for being an amazing human, but also an incredible coach. Oh, thank you, man. No, I really appreciate it. you. Keep plugging ahead too. I, boy, when we spoke two weeks ago, I am just so blown away at your trajectory and the things that you are, are trying to do and, and you're doing it, you know, just it's, it's a quest to find a better way. And, and there's no matter, no better motivator than, than that. It's, it's, I'm just trying to find a better way. And, um, I love your, your quest for that knowledge and, and same thing that, that holds true for me. I certainly don't have things figured out, but I want to learn and I'm super receptive to new ideas. And hopefully, you know, when, when you keep pushing along that you're going to find people that are receptive and want to listen right. and collectively as, as, as a group, you know, we can create a higher level of greatness. That's what it's all about, right? A little team collaboration, a little bit here and there, but. Next time we hang out, I owe you a beer for your time. So thank you so much. <laughs> you need to come down. You need to come here and visit. I will. Oh, absolutely. Right. I'm in. I'm in. All right. I just, I just can't thank promise you. you I'll do all those horrific workouts. No, no, no. <laughs> nothing, diff nothing difficult about a nice little act of recovery. Yeah. I don't want to drown, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye, Chris. All right. We'll thank you, here and thank right. you so much. Thank you, man. All right. We'll see you. <laughs>